So welcome everybody. I know we have people joining, but there will be a recording available in, in the end. So this is going to be a, is a session with the Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archival Standards, who are a group within a Society of American Archivists. And today we will be talking about the creation of the encoded archival context, context functions, EICF or EIF, and how you can be part of us of that finalization. The presenters today is me, Karin Bredenberg from Kommunalförbundet Sydarkivera, a municipality organization in Sweden, who is a, a international co-chair of TSEAS, and also the team lead for the work with functions. And with me today, I have Jupanti Kutta, uh, also known as Dia. So when you hear me say Dia, it's the same person I'm talking about, who Hello. are at the University of Nicosia. And she, she is one of the team members. And the other one is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Rassey Roque from Emory University. I saw she was waving there. So that's what we are going to talk about. And on, I will just first, so if you go to the next slide, give a short introduction to what TSEAS is. So as I said, we are the Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archival Standards of the, at the Society of American Archivists. And if you really want to know what we are, there is a presentation available already on YouTube. It's from 2020, but it's still valid. So. In that one, the core core things in that one is that what we are is that we are the group that take care of the formats you use to manage and share archival information. And the work we do is heavily re relying on you as users to be moved forward. So we need your comments, suggestions, book reports, and really that's what drives our work moving forward. So on the next slide. We are available in a lot of places, places is, so you can find more information at, for example, the microsite at the uh, Society of American Archivists homepage. We have all our documentation, including notes from all the working groups we have and also from TSEAS, TSEAS in our GitHub repository. There is where you find the schemas and everything. EID is publicated, on, publicated online at the Library of Congress. EIC is publicated at the Staatsbibliothek Berlin. We have a mailing list and don't be fooled by it being named EID. It covers all the EIS standards. And one of the ways of contacting and giving us uh, reports regarding bugs and everything, that is through GitHub. Another way is using the issue a form that you can find at the web page at the SAA. So that is if you don't want to have an account on GitHub, you just fill in the same things there and we will create the GitHub issue because that's the way we make sure that we are transparent is by having it in GitHub. The next slide. So when we do work with standards in TSEIS, we have two set of rules to follow. We have ourselves set up an annual, annual rolling revision cycle for minor releases, and that's available, available on GitHub. Here we are talking about things like fixing spelling errors. As you hear, my native language is not English. That means when we write, it's not always correctly spelled, so we fix that. That is minor revision. And But also when we need to do bigger revisions, like for example, EID in, is, is currently in revision. That is something that we actually need to hand over to standards committee to get approved, which in their hand give it to SAA council. So it really is a hierarchical way of getting approval to do things. Uh, the same with having uh, guidance from standards committee and council counts when it comes to uh, creation of a new standard. So all the work that we will be put in, have put in into functions will, if it becomes a standard, also go through this procedure before it's going to be published. You can take the next one. So first I want to start off with a note about RIC. And 
RIC was uh, the recursion context, the content model was released in November last year. And it's coming from ICA, so the International Council of Archives, and it's the new standard for describing archives. So it's replacing the old ones, ISAR, CPF, ISAG, and ESDF, and you will hear more about those later today. And the EA standards will become a way of expressing RIG through XML, but it will take its time. So minor adoptions are or has already been, been created, uh, created and, other, and used in, for example, EACCBF, where linkage to vocabulary, vocabularies were introduced. That is being enhanced in EAD in the new version. And we are, for the functions, all also reusing those kind of things. But more adoptions to the EAS standards to be possible to follow follow RIC is coming later. So you need to remember that these adoptions will actually require a major revision. So that is something where we also, as I said on the pre previous slide, we need to have council and standards committees with us with that work. So we were going to follow the revision cycles in that work moving forward. So have that in mind. So we are just talking about functions today. So moving over to today's subject, it's really is the encoded archival context functions. And I'm going to start off with some of the basics. And then Dia and Elizabeth will continue with into the more details. So it all started off in at a meeting in 2013 in Brussels, where a group of people, both from predecessors to TSAS was there and others, where work had started with creating a scheme, own schemas for functions and trying to do something with functions. But it got decided at that time that there needs to be a working group and that working group ended up being part of TSEAS. So during 2021 and 2024, we have had a sub team taking over the work was, that was done earlier in TSEAS. And we have created a suggestion, you having a white paper as the description of what, what we are wanting to do and a number of examples. So since it's, this is not a published standard so far, there is no web page but you have the current documentation being on the SIA webpage, and that is the call for comments. There you have access to everything. And you also have our team notes being in GitHub. So if you want to see what we have been discussing and so on, it's available there. Next slide. So what is this? Yeah, well, it's uh, the way of describing the functions or functions as processes and activities that generate records and records groups. It's kind of the glue in between the creator and the records. How do we make sure that we have that knowledge and save that knowledge of how things were done? It is closely connected to EAD and EIC CPF, of course. You need all these three to be able to see a record's whole context. So that also gives that this will be the third component needed for making ES standards uh, RIC compatible. It is based upon the International Standard for Describing Functions published by ICA. And as I said, there will be some more words about that. Here is the big why. So we need a way to show in XML, because a lot of solutions is, are still using XML, uh, to show how these records was created, how the functions that, the, in most cases, cor corporate bodies, it can be discussed if it's just corporate bodies that have, have functions and activities, but the main focus is the corporate bodies, but of course you can use this also for, for persons and families. And with corporate bodies, remember that it's all type of corporate bodies, it's organizations, it's big companies and everybody. 
being a group. And what we also do is with this work is that we have looked into and make sure that we are using recognized ontologies and metadata models. We are not invent inventing something new. We want to have something that is consistent. It's possible, it gives interoperability and it also it gives you possibility to adapt to your needs and making sure that as far as possible, it's going to be easily to integrate with the ex existing practices and systems that are around. So just trying to make sure that we, as I said, we have the glue in between the creator and the record. And the next slide. So this is a question that we also have been thinking about. So why not just use EAC CPF who describes the record or the record, the creator? And since the creator is the one creating the records, isn't it enough if the information is there? Well, if you look at how the function is described in EAC CPF, it is within the creator. And you give a term for what the function is, and you can give, give a descriptive note. It is not possible to give a hierarchy of functions or relate the functions. Um, and working as we the most of most of us do is that we see that well the process tree that we have can become rather huge and it's not as easy as just described in a descriptive note we need to have a way of really create these i would say bubbles to show the functions and activities and how they are related and also make it possible to reuse them because there might be functions that someone else can reuse. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Tia to start and talk about what we have been looking at and what we have been done doing. Thank you, Gary. Uh, well, as uh, mentioned before, we based our work um, on the international standard for describing functions by the International uh, Council on Archives that was published back in 2007 and has been translated in 10 languages. ISDF provides a method uh, for documenting functions as separated entities and suggests a structure for their detailed description adding them in a catalog and as function records that can be managed independently. In this context, it is useful to say that we are using the term function to include all possible subdivisions uh, of the business processes, uh, sub-functions, activities, etc. The ISDF provides guidelines to distinguish the different types uh, <clears throat> of uh, functions and um, suggests, uh, I said before, that each function can be described uh, separately. By developing records for each function and connecting them to the other function records, we can uh, uh, connecting them based on the established relationship, we can create a standalone index of the business processes that uh, are generate uh, that generated the records in an organization. In ISDF, we find uh, a proposal how to map all the activities of corporate bodies uh, that use and create records and uh, create this map, this index, uh, in a way that is not limited to the organization, uh, organizational structure. On, it is not limited on mapping just the organizational structure. Uh, yes, Karin mentioned that the documentation of function is already done in, the, in an extent by including some information about the functions into the authority record of the creators. And it's reasonable to ask why, again, we need to have separated entities. 
Um, <clears throat> actually, the answer is because we can document uh, the relationships. Here you can uh, see the illustration of an example um, published in the um, ISDF English edition. Uh, this illustration, in this illustration, you can see in the yellow boxes the records of the functions. In the green boxes, the records of the creators, the authority records of the creators of the agents, and in the light blue box. Uh, the record of the archival material. What we see here, and it's, it is uh, given by ISDF, is that by identifying and analyzing functions as separated records, we can connect them to other functions, but also we can connect them to the archival material and the authority records. By this connection, we can document their hidden uh, relationships between all these different entities. And we are actually complete the description of the archival context. Now, uh, the ISDF is following the structure of ISAD general and also um, keeps the concept of the authority records that is established in the ISAAR CTF. We find here also four information areas. The identity area, when we add all the identity information about the function, the type of function, uh, information about the authorized uh, forms of name or other forms of name, parallel names, and also the classification scheme, if there is one uh, regarding functions. In context area, um, we actually describe the main purpose of the function and we give information about the history, the legal basis, and the dates that the function was active. Uh, ISDF in the third area, the relationship area, uh, gives guidelines how we can connect the uh, functions entities, the functions uh, records, between them, how, how we make the connections, how we document the hierarchical, temporal, and associated relationships that exist. And uh, the four area is the control area, is a maintenance area about uh, uh, the record itself uh, with information about the record uh, dates, creation, revision, the level of uh, detail, the status, uh, etc. Now, uh, in ISDF, there is a separated uh, chapter that provides a second type of relationship. And this type of relationship concerns how we should link the function record with the records of the creators and the archival materials. Our proposed schema follows the structure in, uh, found in uh, ISDF and also uses the elements and attributes that they are common in the other EAS uh, standards. Our subgroup, as Karin mentioned, is keeping an eye on the current updates of the EAD and any changes to certain elements and attributes will be included to the proposed standards. Uh, <clears throat> Now, how we are proposing uh, the structure of the different areas. Here we can see the control area. The control area in the EAF is following the control area in EAS uh, standards uh, with the attributes that already exist. The identity area follows the description of the identity found, uh, identity element found in EAC CPF. The context area follows also the description of the context uh, element in EAC CPF. And now we are coming to the relationship area. Uh, as we said before, we have the need to relate a, fun a function record with other functions 
and the function re record with other entities such as archival material and record creators. Uh, this relationship area involves all the information about the relationship, the type, the category, and uh, the dates also of this uh, relationship. And uh, our proposal is, uh, we, we, we propose two ways of forming uh, the connection between the function records, uh, between the function records. So uh, in the first way, we create a um, function record, a function description for each function, and we relate the two records using the relationship elements found uh, using the relationship elements found in other EAA as um, uh, standards. Now, the second way uh, of relating uh, two functions is the second option is by creating a single record for the main uh, function and adding all the interrelated uh, functions, all the other functions that are related to the main function uh, as a part of the main function uh, description. Uh, maybe it will be more clear using this picture. Uh, here we are using uh, the relation element. Uh, we have created two different uh, records for functions and we are using uh, and we relate them together. In this, uh, uh, in the second way, the second option, we are creating the main single uh, record for our uh, upper level function. And we are adding all the sub functions and related functions information and relationship as part of this record uh, description. Now, relating functions to corporate bodies, archival materials and other resources, uh, we, ex we, we have the separated uh, record for functions and we are using uh, the relation, uh, uh, the, the relation element to relate the two different uh, records, the record of the function and the record of the uh, agent or the archival material. And now I will give the floor to Elizabeth to explain more with examples. Yeah, thank you, Dia. Um, so throughout the entire process of us um, trying to draft a new EAD standard, um, this team has found it incredibly helpful to continually create sets of examples. So this is include entity diagramming, which Dia showed you some of earlier, as well as some test XML records. Um, so here is the um, examples that we've created to share with the community to get feedback on and allow you to see what it looks like in practice, not just in theory of looking at a schema file. Um, so we have um, generated an example that really is designed to look at the entire suite of records and how they work together. So um, we have an EAF record that relates to our EAD record that relates to our EAC record. So you can see that as well as a file of all the proposed um, EAF elements and attributes. Next slide. Thanks. Um, so this is just an illustrative example of how our example records work together um, when we're talking about EAF. So the example that we've created that we are sharing um, in that file in the call for comments um, describe a fictional creator called the Fictional Testing Center. Um, and in our imaginary scenario, we're imagining it's engaged, the center is engaged in pro project development, namely grant writing. Um, and we then use the EAS suite of standards to describe each of these entities and all the relationships between them. As Dia described earlier, the creator is gonna be described in our EAC record, which is connected to the record group, which is our EAD record through activities 
um, and functions, which is our proposed EAF record. So essentially EAF kind of sits in the middle um, of these two and negotiates that relationship. So this is what the AAF record in XML might look like. This comes from our example. Um, this EAF record is using that first option where we have two different records or more um, to describe not only the function, the umbrella function, which is going to be the record on the left, the development function, and then it would have a series of activities underneath of it. Each one of those activities could potentially have its own record that relates back to um, the super function of uh, the development function. And then those are tied together. These records are tied together through the relations elements um, to describe their place in the hierarchy, such as sub element of, as you see in the record um, on the right or sub activity or sub function. Um, that record that you see on the right also, you can see some of the other relationships that functions can um, describe. So if you look under relations towards the bottom of the screen, um, you can see a relationship to an EAC record um, to um, describe the agent and describe who was performing the action that's being described um, in our record. This is the secondary option um, that Dia talked about, where we create a single EAF record and don't try to create sets of hierarchies through records, but instead try to describe that within one single XML file. So rather than describing each activity separately, this schema, um, the EAF schema will allow this option for implementers who really don't need that level of specificity to have strings of records, but instead describe it all within a single record. So in both of the options, um, so both option one and option two, um, the XML includes this relations um, section that allows implementers to define relationships to EAC records representing the agent. You can connect to agents. Um, and you can also um, connect to EAD records that represent the record group description. Notice um, that these elements um, allow you not only to point to the related entity, but also define the relationship between the two of those. So instead of it being sort of embedded as in it's related, it's an agent, it must be a creator, what the schema will allow you to do, and EAD4 is also going in this direction as well as EAC, it allows you to choose a vocabulary um, to actually define that not only more precisely, but allows different implementers to choose the vocabulary that they want to use. Here we've done it with RIC in our examples to show compatibility with RIC and how we can use some of the properties um, and classes of RIC to be able to describe things within our EAF records. But you could also use any other ontology that makes sense for your local context. So if you're working with digital objects, perhaps you want to use premise vocabularies here to describe those relationships. If you are in an institution that is working with BibFrame, perhaps you want to use BibFrame. So there's a lot of options um, open in the construction that we have here um, with the relationship elements. And then finally, um, we have um, the example, oh, actually the EAD is the next example. We also have the EAC CPF example. So here's our EAD example. Again, we're using relations to connect records um, in the EAD um, file back to the EAC file and the EAF file. So in each of the records that we're looking at, you're going to be able to make through relations, you're going to be able to make connections to the records, as well as the agent and our EA record, EAF record serves as an intermediary there. And then here is our EAC record. Again, similar construction where we have the usual description that we've had before, but through relations, um, we are able to um, relate different records together. Um, hopefully this quick walkthrough, and I know this was really quick, um, demonstrates how records, the way that we've conceived of this, 
is really designed to have records that work in tandem. Um, rather than having one record that describes everything by having multiple records like was done with EAC CPF, it allows you to have a greater level of specificity and control um, to be able to describe records more fully and not instead of relying on single documents, um, instead we have documents that work together through relationships, which is a lot closer in some ways to how um, the world of linked data is starting to think through semantic relationships. So um, a, along with all of those examples, um, we also have a file that has all the elements and attributes if you want to explore everything that's possible. Um, but I hope as you look at the examples that we have here that it will be kind of a bit of an entry pathway for you um, to be able to start to think of what would this look like in practice. Um, and one of the things that I think we would all say is if you create your own, we would love to see them. Um, as I mentioned at the top of when I started talking, one of the things that examples help us do is allow us to see where things work and where they start to fall apart. So it would be incredibly important and helpful if you play with these standards and if you play with these example XML files, we would love to benefit um, from your experience and be able to incorporate any issues that you've seen into the ultimate standard that's proposed. Yeah, so I think both Via and Elizabeth has been into what the goal of what we are have with this call for comments, and it's actually to get a, quite frankly, a yes or no if we should finalize what we are proposing. Uh, if we get a yes, we will create the schema and tag library. If it's not a clear yes in the response responses. Uh, yeah, well, the white paper is there and the examples are free to use. But yeah, so we really need you to respond to the call for comments. And on the next slide, to make it even more feasible for you to do that after hearing this session is that we have actually decided to extend the call for comments until the 20th of October. So you have some more time to look into this. And in the survey, you actually you have uh, a number of places where you can write text, even if it's not the correct, really correct place for writing what Elizabeth asked you for and what we all are asking you for. Use the text fields and let us know of, about your use cases. And also, if you have examples that we could use and look at, and also if you have, as Elizabeth said, if you have seen something. You're missing to add, you haven't added this, we need this. Please let us know because we are open to all types of suggestions. Especially if you give us a yes in that survey so we will finalize the work. Uh, do Elizabeth or Dia want to add anything? Otherwise we will open up the chat for questions. Yeah, and if I can just chime in a little bit on what Karen just said. Um, so I did mention about XML-based examples, but one of the things that would be really helpful, especially for those of us in the US um, that have a bit of more of a manuscripts tradition and perhaps work less in functions, um, it would be really helpful um, to have some use cases. Um, even if you just have a narrative use case of, I wanted to describe this and had to put it in narrative note, and I wish I could describe more, those would be immensely helpful. Um, and we would love to work with you um, to help mock that up. Um, so anything, any sort of suggestions that you have would be really useful. Thank you. We have gotten one question in the, in the chat and that's regarding a link to where this slide will be shared. Uh, as far as I know, we will send out I'll send out a link in an e in an information e same information email where we will inform about the uh, extension of the call for comments. So it will be coming tomorrow. So I'm not totally hundred percent sure on exactly which sub page it will be placed, but you will get that by tomorrow. Any more questions? Uh, 
And if you feel comfortable, you will be recorded. It's okay to wave your hand and, and I will let you unmute and ask your, ask your, ask your question. Hi, um, I'm not sure if I missed this because I'm unfortunately multitasking while trying to listen and engage with this, but um, the I was looking at the EAD 2002 example and it doesn't seem to have uh, the one that I'm fine. I found, I'll post the link in the chat. I don't see it, the, I see it in the EAD 3 example, but not in the EAD 2002. So I'm not sure if it's missing or how the, maybe there's not a good way to express this in EAD 2002. So as far as you could follow up on that too. I saw Elizabeth nodding. Will you add in? Sure. And and that is exactly, you hit the nail on the head, Greg, is that in 2002, there are elements, namely the relation elements that don't do this very well. Um, and so the EAD 2002 example kind of uses a bit of hijacking in order to be able to express some of this. Um, so it is possible. Um, but not great. Um, this is one of those places where as much as we want to make our standards backward compatible, um, there is a point at where EAD 2002 just doesn't achieve this very well. And we have two questions in the chat. Uh, I will start with the first, first one. Yes, examples are uh, welcome no matter the language. I think we can cover a lot of languages, so no no problem if they are not in English. And if it's some something you really want to point us to, just write that in in beside as a note beside, so we get some explanation. But otherwise, I think we are we will handle it. Mm -hmm. And the other question is regarding archive space. So we have shown that Atom has a way of describing. Uh, encoding functions, but archive space. And I'm going to lean on you, Elizabeth, there because I'm not using archive space. No, it's fine. Um, so archive space does not. Um, there is not a good way to do this. I think one of the hopes here, and it's something that will have to happen in archive space anyway, if they want to move towards RIC. Um, functions is a crucial part of that data model in RIC. Um, so this is something archive space community will need to start looking at um, as they start thinking about compatibility in the future. Um, so long answer to say, no, it doesn't. But my hope as an archive space user is that it will at some point, mostly because I appreciate the specificity that functions give us. Um, and from my context, being mostly in a manuscript repository, I'm thinking more of using functions as ways for us to document how we as archivists are working with records and documenting provenance um, around those sorts of things, um, I think would be immensely useful um, to how we describe records. Yeah, and also can, can add into that one that, uh... We have met people from business archives in US that says, oh, wait, wait, when will, when will we be able to use this standard? So for the business archives, this is, will also be a good aid. Uh, I can't give a date when it will be ready if it is a yes, but uh, fingers crossed, knock on wood, since as uh, we have shown you, we are using the shared elements that are in the EIS standard, that means that there are actually not that many elements that are function specific. So it's, it's uh, less work of creating, the, creating things when we reuse things, which is a goal for the EIS standards that we are do things in the same way. A date is a date, no matter in which of the standard it is. So that reuse will make the time to create this and finalize it become shorter, but it will still take its time. So fingers crossed, knock on wood. If it's a yet, yes, there might be a Christmas present uh, next year. Any more questions? I see that we have some thank yous in the chat.
otherwise the, our big big call here is please respond to our call for comments uh, we want to see if it's as i said if it is a yes or a no if we should finalize this the things i'm hearing is that it's leaning towards a yes but we want to have that in your writing you are almost anonymous but not totally uh, if you just if you decide to give us information information and make it may make it possible for us to ask you follow up questions uh, you need to give us an email otherwise you can be anonymous so i think we will end a little bit earlier i know this is maybe in your lunch time so many thanks for having participated and listened to us. And as I said, the recording will be available on the YouTube channel as soon as it's ready. We make sure that we'll make sure that you get the survey or survey the presentation uh, quite soon through one of a message on one of our usual, usual channels. And with that, I will stop the recording and. Thank you, everybody, for joining us.